Hello everybody, this is Mo Verney on the Move. Welcome to my inaugural season of my show here at torontopath.com. I'm very excited and today actually is my birthday as well. So if, in case you want to wish me a happy birthday, send me a tweet. And what better, the biggest birthday gift of them all, having my new show here at torontopath.com. Special shout out to Standout Media and special shout out to my main man, Joseph Morris the director who has all the camera angle making me look good. In case you see me, this is as real as you can be. There's no makeup, there's no hair stylist here. It's all real in your face and that's why I love live stream. And um, special shout out to everybody. It's snowy outside, but you know, this is a great way to be checking out torontopath.com. And here, my first person that I interview and it means a lot to me because everybody knows that I love the Toronto Raptors and I met this guy, special guy, for a long time, and he's like a mentor to me, and he taught me a lot. And he's have a website called Pro B Ball Report. He's the editor, publisher. He's been on a lot of news media, such as USA Today, uh, for, uh, Fox Spot, uh, Sport, and uh, Bleacher Report. He loves basketball. He covers the Toronto Raptors day in, day out with his blog. And here is Steve Broderston. Nice to have you here. Well, thank you very much, Fern, and, and happy birthday. Thank you very much. And that's a great set. It's a, it's a great, great setup. This wonderful director. Yep, Joseph Morris. He's the man. So, Stephen, before we start, let me ask you. I know you don't live in the downtown core, but whenever you come into the Toronto, to the Union Station and cover the, the, the Raptors ACC, have you have a chance to walk down to the Toronto Path, like, uh, to actually see one of the biggest retail communities underground in Toronto in the world? Well, I've been actually coming into Toronto for a, for a long time on and off. I used to work downtown and walk through the path all the time. And I just walked through to come up here today, and I was surprised by how refreshed everything looked. There's so much new that's down there that I haven't right. seen before. There's always, there are always different stores, different changes. There's all these like uh, one-of-kind stores uh, as well as big boxes. And uh, have you had coffee yet today? <laughs> I picked up my Tim's on the way in. It was required. Yeah. You, you know what, after the show, uh, we'll go down for lunch and I will show you, w there's a great place called Manhattan Burgers. And they have a SOB, a signature burger that I really like myself. And uh, I will show you around. It's just a beautiful, delicious at the path. And uh, Toronto Path is just huge. Like, a lot of people get lost. So in case you're lost, go to torontopath.com and get the app because that is where the map that will show you around. I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you, you know your way around, right? Uh, I know my way around up to uh, about Queen's Park. Okay, <laughs> it's huge. So Stephen, um, tell the audience, the Toronto Paths subscribers, uh, what, do you, like, what, what other stuff you do and uh, about your site? Well, probably will pro focuses primarily on Toronto Raptors, but I cover every team in the NBA. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience to get down to cover the games to go to the visitor's locker room, talk to the players, see the coaches pre and post game. You, you get a wonderful insight on what really goes on with teams that are uh, rebuilding like the Raptors have seemingly been doing forever, or talking to Coach Popovich, who is literally bored by the questions because his team seems to be first place every year. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, uh, that's really right. So I, I noticed that you, you start writing and covering Raptors since 2009, am I correct? Yeah, that was the first, first year I started writing about the team. Uh, I've been going to games since they were at the Sky Dome. So what got you into uh, writing and covering the Raptors? How it got started? Like someone reached out to you? or It was just interest. Uh, I always enjoyed following the team. I was just looking for an outlet uh, at the beginning. Like uh, you watch a lot of fans get into writing. And I just got carried away. Uh, I started writing every day. I got a chance to write for Hoops World after about nine months, which was a wonderful experience. Uh, a U.S. website owned by USA Today that's unfortunately no longer with us, but stays Basketball Insiders. Um, and this year I have my own site. I get to do my own thing and focus on the Raptors more than I was able to writing for a U.S.-based website. You know, for, for the first show, I realized one thing I really liked. You got a mic, I got a mic. I don't have to like, here's the question and here you go. So I really like that, it's very comfortable. Now, as people see me live right here, I'm actually wearing uh, my the Toronto Raptors OVO 416 Drake, it's Drake Knight, which I got the t-shirt, and uh, I love it, it's very comfortable. So, Stephen, can you tell us, walk through your day-to-day -day, uh, 
routine going to the Raptors, covering them? Because I myself never been to a locker room. I just want to know, like a lot of viewers probably want to know, exactly what you do every day and what's the, what is it like in the locker room in terms of mood and, and the vibe. Game day is a really interesting experience when you're covering the team. Uh, most people show up at the arena for 7 o'clock. When you're going to cover the team, you show up at the arena about 4.30. Uh, you go in, there's a nice media room set up, which has pre-game packages, get you up to date with what's been going on with both teams. And then the coaches talk shortly after 5 o'clock, and you get a chance to ask who's playing. Uh, if there's a player who's been having a good few games or a good season, you get a little more insight into what's going on with them. And then the locker rooms open up for a half hour at about a quarter after, quarter after six. And you get to go in and see who's available. It's not every player is available every game, but you get a lot of opportunity to talk to people individually where there's not a lot of pressure and you can ask them really anything you like. Uh, it's a great opportunity to get background on what players like, uh, why things are going right or wrong for them at the moment. And uh, you get the opportunity to go into both dressing rooms, talk to typically four or five players before each game. And uh, Well, that's amazing, four or five players. That's almost like half a team. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> One third. Um, and then you basically start to prepare for how you're going to cover the game while the game's on. Um, a lot of people like to live tweet the games. Yeah. Um, well, like me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a, it's, I've live tweeted the games off the television and out of the arena, and it's a very, very different experience in both cases. Uh, if you haven't been down to see a game live, it's a wonderful opportunity to see it from a different perspective. If you watch the same game later, you would swear they were two different games. Oh, okay. they are complete, it's a completely different view of the world. Uh, games that are deadly boring on television can be exciting in the arena. Wow. Why, why is that? Why, why do you think? Is just the in, internal entertainment that may drive the game? It's partly internal entertainment, but Toronto is very fortunate in terms of being a large sport market. Even when the team's doing poorly, the building's not empty. There's a lot of vibe in the building. My personal experience is the Raptors have a better vibe than the Leafs do. The building's more alive for a basketball game. Uh, the fans really get into it. They tend to be loud. They tend to cheer and boo. And, and special shout to the Raptors fans packed. Uh, that really makes a difference too. That's one of the things that always sort of bothered me about how the game's covered. The dance pack do a really good job. And if you're in the building, you get to see it. If you're watching on TV, you might get to see five seconds. Yeah. So Stephen, w t tell me about the opposition lo locker room and the Raptors locker room. Do you, do you see a difference when you cover it? Is, is the opposition make you more excited because they only probably come twice a year? Or how approachable are they? Are, are they similar level when you uh, cover them? The the players who are in the locker room, because they don't have to go in the locker room. Some of them go out and they do shoot around oh. while the ac media access is going on. And that is partly just to avoid us. But <laughs> they have the right to do that. Some of them hide in the back and get treatment. But usually you have a good selection of players who are willing to sit in the locker room and talk to the media. Uh, except for the rookies who haven't been through this before. These guys see the media every day. Mm -hmm. They're really used to us. It, they are who they are. Uh, they're not hard to talk to. Um, the Raptors locker room, like every home team's locker room, is fairly luxurious. The visitors locker room would remind you more of what your kids would get dressed in for their minor hockey league game. It's yeah. pretty Spartan. So um, w what are some of the greatest memory you have uh, covering in the locker room that, 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 that really comes to your mind that you always remember the, per the players that you have interviewed in the past? Well, one of my favorite players to interview over the years was Jose Calderon. He was always a really, a really nice guy to talk to, always really tried to answer your questions. Uh, Aaron Gray was a fun guy in the locker room because he's a very genuine guy. He wants, he seems to outwardly want to help people. He wanted to help us in the media by giving us very long answers to anything we asked. Uh, he always was willing to talk to all the players in the team. If you went around the locker room and talked to the 
younger players, they all would mention Aaron Gray and how he would get involved with them and help them out. Um, it's, it's, really, it's really interesting when you get <coughs> to go back and talk to players who played in Toronto and come back. Generally, they're all really, really happy to come back here. Uh, just uh, a little over a week ago, I got to talk to Quincy AC before the game. Nice. Uh, he's a really nice young man. He was really happy to be back, uh, as was Aaron Gray and, and Rudy Gay as well. Right. Uh, they enjoyed their time here. Um, but it was, it was a fun interview with Quincy because he's a young, outgoing guy yeah. who's really upbeat. Yeah, I remember uh, in case the, the Toronto have uh, Quincy, AC, Aaron Gray, and Rudy Gay were traded to the Sacramento Kings uh, for some of the players back. So last Friday were their first time coming back to Toronto playing against the Raptors. And uh, yeah, I see Quincy AC at the open gym and he was devastated when he first got traded. And I mean, that, that was as real as you can get. I was even surprised that there was footage of as real as you can get to when someone's really, you know, sadly to leave the team and that was as really genuine to see Quincy AC. So I'm happy to see him doing well in Sacramento and best, uh, best of luck to his career there. Yeah, no, uh, since he's been to Sacramento he plays 15 minutes a night in the rotation every night so he's really happy to be there yeah. but he misses his time in Toronto. He, he liked the team. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the unique things about the Toronto Raptors. Not every team's like this. I've been in locker rooms where the teams are dysfunctional and it's really obvious. And you can feel that. It, oh, you it's, just, it's the moment you go in, you, you can, can tell. see it. You can tell wow. almost, almost instantly. Toronto locker room's filled with nice guys. They all like each other. That's been true for a while. Uh, even before the trade with the team, the team's playing very well now, mm -hmm. but even when the team was not playing as well at the start of the year, mm -hmm. the locker room wasn't a problem. It was still a good locker room. They were good guys. Okay. Nice. So, Stephen, before I, before I um, talk more, I just want to tell the fans... The reason why Mulverney is because all because of Morris Peters in number 24, my favorite Raptors of all time, and that's why my, my first name is Vernon, my nickname is Verney, and Mo, Mo Pete, Mo Verney, that's how it comes. Special shout out to Mo Pete, number 24. And for anyone who's tuning in, I'm giving away an autograph, 4x6, all star DeMar DeRozan autograph photo. So if you want to have a chance to win this, remember to tweet with hashtag Mulverney contest is M-O-V-E-R-N-I-E contest. That's simple for a chance to win to DeMar DeRozan. Now, Stephen, that was really amazing. I mean, when you're talking about the atmosphere, how solid the team uh, in the locker room, something that we wouldn't be able to see as an audience. Now, talking about the season, the Raptors, at the beginning of the season, th there were a lot of turmoil, and it seems that Rudy Gay and DeMar DeRozan, DeMar DeRozan has been emerging this season, Surprisingly, I, I'm really impressed with him. Last week, I went to the MSC Players Gala. He, he was about to go there to uh, be interviewed, and he recognized me. He turned it back and let me interview. The first one I told him was like, do you, man, do you practice a lot? You work hard this summer. Now it pays off for you. He, he has penetration moves. Uh, he, his shot is really good. He become the leader of this team. Um, tell us about the outlook of the, the Raptors, why, why you think suddenly after the trade that it works out for the team, especially, we got four players from Sacramento Kings. That's basically like the second unit for the Kings, but it didn't work in Sacramento. But these four players actually worked well in Toronto. Why, why do you think was that? Well, in Sacramento, those four players, well, if you look at Grievous Vasquez was a starting point guard. Right. John Summers started quite a few of the games there, as did Patrick Patterson. Sacramento has, had, has chemistry issues. They don't have a talent issue. They have wonderful talent on yeah, the team. They DeMar's have three cousins. 20 game scores right now. Yeah. 20 points a game. They are a well talented team. They don't have cohesion. Those four guys came in here and it was so obvious from the first time I talked to them, they were desperate to win. They were willing to do anything to win. Grievous Vasquez didn't care if he came off the bench, sat on the bench, barely got in a game. Just let me win a few games, it's been so long. And that was the same for Patrick Patterson. It was the same for Chuck Hayes, who didn't get to play at first, and they made him work out and get back in shape because he hadn't play, been playing a lot. Uh, John Salmons, when I first talked to him, he really thought he was a throw-in and he was gone because his contract's not guaranteed for next year. He got here. He was throwing right out there. He became... The 12-year veteran the Raptors were missing, the glue guy in the second unit to hold things together and to pick up Terrence Ross, 
He was really too young to be starting, but very talented. When he gets in trouble, you got an old vet to throw him behind him and basically pick him up, bring, him, bring, bring the team back. It's a wonderful role for Solomons. All these guys got an opportunity to win. And because of that, and I think because of how things were going in Sacramento and how bad things had been for them there in terms of being able to find a way to win games, they were all willing to sacrifice. They were all willing to do whatever the coach asked them. When you get a bunch of players willing to do whatever the coach asked them, chemistry can happen. So this just worked out really well. Um, Terrence Ross moving the starting lineup was really good for his confidence. Uh, he's blossomed because of it. You'll notice some games, like his last game, 12 points in the first quarter, doesn't get another bucket the rest of the game. Yeah. That's, you get that. He's a Things young happens. guy. That's going to happen. You have to live with that. Right. But if you look at his progress from the start of the year to now, and you go, wow, that, that's been really, really good for Terrence Ross to have this opportunity to start when he's playing well to finish out games and have you a huge impact player. He has become a player that the team can go, we want to hang on to this guy. We're gonna, he's going to be part of our future. Yeah. And that might not have happened without the trade. Yeah, because then Rudy Gay would be starting and playing most of the minutes and uh, kind of deterred uh, the development of Terrence Ross. I got to say Terrence Ross, amazing talent. Last year, he was a slam dunk guy. This year, he was master his three-pointer. So he, every year, he's stepping and masters certain skills. And sooner or later, he'll become a very all-around player that, that will complement De DeMar DeRozan. It's, uh, it's really hard for young guys in the league. So many of them get into situations where they don't get to play. Um, if you come in the league and you become like Terrence Ross last year, you won the slam dunk contest, there's a really good chance you turn into Gerald Green. Yeah. And, it, you know, the end of your rookie deal, you're out of the league and you got to fight your way back in and you have all the talent to be there, but you never have an opportunity to develop it. Right. Uh, and he was at that risk at that point without this move, that he wasn't going to develop those other skills where he's now a very good defensive player. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Last year, he got the slam dunk title, but there were no minutes, like nothing else. And people had perception that all he can do was dunk. But he's showing us, example, against the Clippers, he was scoring career high 15 plus points. Yeah. That's crazy. That's amazing. And he was shooting at different areas of the paint, not just shooting three, but everywhere. And that's a good sign to see. Yeah. And it's, you, your jury said this all the way through from the start of the year. He wanted to see what he had. He wanted to throw the young guys out there and see what he had. He would let the players really decide what moves he needs to make to make the team better. It's been really fun to watch because I honestly believe he didn't know who was going to step up, who was going to become the guys this team could build around. Mm -hmm. He's watching it and going, gee, I like what I see. Mm -hmm. I have a bunch of nice young guys here. They're really coming along. Teams. Teams winning two thirds of their game since yeah. the trade. That's really a remarkable rate for yeah. a young team. But you know what? Life is good as a Raptor fan because every time I go to a game, you, they have every chance to play hard, to compete. They never really bail in every game. Every game is exciting, and that's the best what the Raptors fan looking for. To and and winning the game is icing on the cake. Uh, one thing I like to address though, in terms of draft, I, I know there are a lot of controversy. People might not. But I have negative comments on Brian Colangelo, former Raptors GM. I got to say, I got to give him props for drafting the number of players. Some of the success that these players have been were through the draft. DeMar DeRozan, Jonas Valanciunas, Terrence Ross, uh, just to name a few. Like, these are the pieces that are actually developing right here. I, I mean, um, now the, the current GM, Mansai, have you actually met him in person? I've talked to him a number of times. What's this like? He's a, he's a really interesting guy. One of the, before the season started and we're going through their, they're doing their, their workouts and they're bringing players around in the early part of the summer. And uh, I asked him basically, you, you seem to be doing what you told us you'd do back when you first got here. And he looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> uh, I don't think he understands. We're used to in Toronto being fed what looks like total lines of BS. That's not your jury's way. When he says he's evaluating talent and making decisions what to do, mm -hmm. that's really what he's doing. Mm -hmm. uh, when he says the players will make the decision as to what the next move the team makes is, mm -hmm. he means that. When he talks about 
at the end of the year, he talked, Rudy Gay, Cal Lowry, I'm not worried about these guys. How they play on the court will determine what happens. Mm -hmm. Well, what they tried to do with Rudy Gay didn't work. And I don't blame Rudy Gay for this. They had a, they had a plan for Rudy, and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Rudy Gay gets moved out. They had a plan for what they wanted from Cal Lowry. Cal Lowry's bought into the plan and is playing the best basketball of his career. Amazing now they are, guy. And you have to take Ujuri at his face because that's the way he's been since he's arrived in Toronto. Mm -hmm. He said they would just have to deal with the success. Well, that's what we're all waiting for. And I, if Playoffs. Toronto fans aren't a little jaded <laughs> in the past, <laughs> they have every right to be. Yeah. But Ujuri has so far done what he said he's going to do. And that's amazing, staying on course. Two more questions for you, Stephen. Now, last week, it kind of really saddens me that Rudy Gay came back to Toronto. He only played for Toronto for seven months, got traded to Sacramento. He came back for the first time, and he got boos. Now, to me, like, I mean, there, there should be a difference, distinction of players such as Vince Carter, like, you, you can boo whatever you want. But this guy only came here for seven months. It's not his fault. It just didn't fit. DeMar DeRozan stepped up, and he be, be become expandable. Your thoughts on Rudy Gay being booed by the Toronto Raptors fans? I'm not a big fan of booing players. Other than if there's a player like if Dwight Howard can't hit a free throw to save his life because you're waving at him and booing him, you should boo him. The idea is to make your team win. <laughs> booing someone because they touched the ball because you're upset because they're not on your team anymore, it seems kind of pointless. Rudy yeah. didn't do anything bad. He just didn't. He didn't play well in the system he was put in. Uh, Rudy's always been a scorer. He's been a scorer from day one in the league. Ujuri and Casey tried to convert this guy who's basically been a finisher his whole career into someone who was a facilitator, a playmaker, a guy you throw the ball to at 20 seconds to go on the clock and does something for you. He's never done that before. He was terrible at it. He goes to Sacramento, they don't do that anymore, and he's shooting 50% from the field and scoring 20 points a game, and he's the guy he always was. It's not Rudy's fault Toronto tried to go. We need more from you. If you're going to be a $19, $20 million guy, you're going to make $20 million? We need more from you than 20 points. Yeah. I understand that, but it's not his fault he couldn't do it. He never could do it before. <laughs> <laughs> Not in the Memphis Grizzly system. And I <laughs> don't blame you, jury, for going, if you can't do this, we're going to have to trade you and move you out of here because we can't have a $20 million player who can't do more than just score. Right. So it's, he doesn't deserve to be booed for failing at something where he was put into the situation to see if he could do it. Uh, he's going to help Sacramento. Sacramento still needs to find people to facilitate the ball so he can be the effective player he was with Memphis. Mm -hmm. But he's not playing bad for them. He didn't play bad for Memphis. Memphis largely traded him for the same reason Toronto did. Yeah. You're going to pay someone $20 million, he needs to be able to do more than just score 20 points. Yeah. So, another thing. It really saddens me at the same game. I don't know what happened to the Raptors fan these days, but like life is so good, but yet they're booing for ridiculous reasons. They're booing Rudy Gay at the same game, and at that same game, the Raptors scored 99 points. As we all know now, diehard Raptors fan, anytime the Raptors score 100 points, now the system has changed that they also have to win the game so that they get home happy with a free slice of pizza pizza. Like in the past, as long as the Raptors score 100 points, they get free slice of pizza pizza. But you know, people start booing even when the Raptors are losing. So this year, pizza pizza the change that you have to score 100 points plus a win. Now, the Raptors won the game, but at 99 points, one point shy of free slice of piece of pizza. And they start booing players, I, I, I could commit, cor correct me if I was wrong, Terrence Ross, all, all kinds of players on the court. How pathetic is that? Like, I personally, I think this is ridiculous. And what's your take on that? And do you think that they should just scrap the promotion, just, just get, get it over with and get the embarrassment out of the way? Every single team in the league has this food promotion. It's not pizza, it could be chicken, it could be McDonald's, whatever. And it's all based on the other team doesn't score over 90 or you score over 100 or pick some magic number. And the same thing happens in every arena. And it's partly because the NBA is an entertainment facility. They have a dance pack, they put on a halftime show, 
They have fee free food promotions. Some marinas do a lot more in Toronto. Toronto just basically does sort of like the bare minimum on these free food type deals. A lot of the fans of the game are there for the other entertainment beyond the basketball game. They want their slice of pizza. I understand why they boo. It's kind of pathetic from a basketball standpoint. But from an entertainment standpoint, I understand. Well, you know what? Like it or not, it does create a buzz. Everybody's talking about it, I guess. It's, it's part of the end-of-game end entertainment that your team, especially in games where it's not close and you're not watching because it's a great basketball game in the last two events, it gives you another thing to watch for that maybe you can get something if you stick around on the end. And it's just a food promotion. It doesn't really bother me. Uh, the booing's kind of pathetic, but I understand it because not everyone in the building's really there for the basketball. Yeah, I guess. But to be honest, personally, every time I keep the ticket stuff, just for memory. So win or lose, I, I don't really redeem the pizza, but yeah, it's a, it's a great bus. So, so you, you should just... It's just part of the game. Part of the game. You know, Stephen, really amazing to have you here for my first show here, uh, Mulvernia on the Move at torontopath.com. And I uh, really thank you. I know you don't live in the, down the court and made it on a snowy day. Really appreciate it. You know, next time we will talk about as the playoffs comes in, uh, we will talk about the positioning of the, the teams, Toronto Raptors. I will, I, 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 to say, play safe that they probably will make the playoffs, right? It's pretty much got to the point where they almost can't make the play. It's You look at who's in eighth, yeah. and it's the Atlanta Hawks <laughs> with 27 wins. And Toronto is 36 wins with 20 games to go. <laughs> it's almost impossible. Well, I'm not a math guy, although I should. But, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take your words for it. Nine, and nine, ga nine games ahead of <laughs> the team in eighth with 20 games to go. I think they can make it. You know what? Um, next time we'll, we'll talk about the playoffs, the positioning of the Raptors. Really thank you for, for your time here. And I hope the, the folks here, the audience, enjoy our show, the, the Toronto Raptors. That's where my heart is. Nice to have you here, Stephen. Thank you, Vern. And special shout out to Standout Media. Thank you to director Joseph Morris, making me look so good here uh, in front of the camera. Sounds good, I think. I know it's going to sound good. And thank you, torontopath.com, for amazing studio. Not too shabby, it's amazing. It's right, Stephen? Very, very, very nice. Studio. You're impressed, right? Amazing studio. I, I love, it's an honor working with great people and talented, creative people here. And stay tuned. If you want to win the DeMar DeRozan autograph picture, Follow me and put hashtag Mulverney Contest. And remember to tune in at 1 p.m. today, this afternoon, because I'm going to interview the Canadian band Talented Navarus. The boys are going to come in. We're going to show you some music video of them, and we're going to chat, have fun. This is why my show is live, because there's no five-second delay. It's all real in your face, and just relax and chill. That's the kind of atmosphere I like to be. And Mulverney on the Move is out here. Okay.